Our next session is LHON Science Update with moderator Paul Laurie. Thanks, everyone. You may have noticed on the schedule uh, that today's presenter for the first science session, uh, you know, and basically an LHON Science Update was uh, scheduled to be Dr. Rustam Karanjia. And he was unable to attend and uh, due to a, a kind of a family emergency. So we are calling an audible. <laughs> and so today we are very fortunate to have Dr. Xavier Loria from KAC to uh, come in and present. Uh, Dr. Uh, Karangia has um, allowed us to use his, his slide presentation so, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Loria from KSC, uh, Global Rare Disease uh, part of KSC, uh, which is a, uh, phar a pharmaceutical company based in, uh, based in uh, Parma, Italy, and, but has, has its uh, US presence in their Global uh, Rare Disease uh, section in Boston. And so, uh, Dr. Uh, Loria is going to uh, do, do the presentation for us and I'll, I'll send it over to him. And we're really grateful for him stepping up and helping us out today. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Lisa, for inviting me. Good morning, everyone. I'm honored to be here, uh, forming part of this huge and very, very uh, impressive organization, the one you have. So I'm really happy to be able to provide my little grain uh, as a contribution to you. What I'm going to be presenting today is the presentation that Dr. Karania uh, prepared. So I'm going to be faithful to his presentation. So the opinions and the statements that you can see are obviously his. My contribution here, as uh, Paul mentioned, is I work for KSC. I'm a physician, I'm a pharmaceutical physician. And before KSC, I worked for Santera, which was the company that developed Idebenon in the, in the indication of LHON. And the study that I'm going to present is actually part of, of that. Right. Um, Rustin's disclosures. I've made my disclosures. So talking just a little bit of a refresher about the disease, you know it very well, but just to set up the scene, this is a disease that requires, obviously, a, a, a genetic uh, alteration or a genetic mutation that affects one of the components of the mitochondria. So that mutation is needed. Now, while you have the mutation and you don't have the, the signs or symptoms, you are just a carrier, healthy carrier, we can call it. However, at some point in life, for reasons that we still don't, don't really understand, different moments in life, you can convert what it's called conversion and then you become symptomatic. At that point, you become a patient. And then so far, the current, the current knowledge is that you're gonna be a patient for the rest of the life. Now, um, quickly about LHO and what are these signs and symptoms? You know them very well, I'll have to explain to you, but this is important when you talk to physicians so that they, can, they are able to recognize things that will draw their attention. This is a low uh, awareness disease, it's a rare disease, and there are other more frequent diseases that, that have um, you know, more, they are more frequent. So, I mean, people suspect about them. You know everything about the colored vision, which is one of the signs. Uh, it progresses to a central vision. You have the peripheral, but not the central. Uh, it, this is due to a problem in the retinal ganglion cells in the, in the retina, which are the ones that are going to form the, the optic nerve. There are ways of looking into the eye and kind of suspecting that there is, some, there is a problem with those cells, like this temporal pallor, and then other, another feature of the disease is that eventually after months uh, of onset, it becomes bilateral. Uh, another important feature is it is asymptomatic. It's not painful, excuse me, sorry, it's not, um, it's painless. And usually the, the start is sequential. So one eye goes first and then the other one. And that might confuse some, some uh, doctors. Right, um, talking about the, the retinal ganglion cells, they, they form part of the central nervous system and we know that the brain is a small thing in our body but it consumes a huge amount of energy. And energy comes from the mitochondrial 
uh, structures inside the cells. So the high consumption energy of the, of the brain and the, the neurons is due to the fact that they need to transmit you know, in, in a non-stop manner impulses and that draws and that requires a lot of energy. Now, there is something in the central nervous system, which is in the, the peripheral, which is important is that some nerves have like a shield, um, sheet that protects them and that helps facilitate the conduction. But in the eye, that sheet does not exist. That myelin is absent inside the eye for several reasons. That makes that those retinal ganglion cells require a lot of energy. So if something happens to the mitochondria, those cells are going to be affected, you know, initially and, and more and more um, in a more um, evident manner. Just going to jump here. So if we look at these retinal ganglion cells, we see on the on the top of the screen, uh, I'm just going to describe it to you, the part of the cell that doesn't have the protection of myelin. So that part requires a lot of energy. And this is why that part has lots of mitochondria, because that mitochondria is going to produce that energy. So now you can imagine that if something happens to them, those cells are going to suffer in the sense that they're not going to be able to function properly. And eventually, they might even you know, die. So having said this, let's talk a little bit more on how we can try to um, change the course. There has been a number of studies, uh, I can say we call them failed here because they have not been, let's say, with positive outcome. So the disease has been tried to address from different perspectives, knowing what happens, just looking at different ways of changing the, um, the situation. And you can see here different products that you've, you've surely heard. Uh, currently, the, the, the two ones that are, let's say, uh, in, in clinical, one is in clinical um, as, as an available drug, and the other one is in, in development or as a gen, gene therapy, which I'm not going to talk, and idevenin, which is what I'm going to talk. Now, before we go into that, one of the complexities of studying LHON uh, with, with uh, therapies for LHON is the fact that you know, there is the possibility of spontaneous improvement. You know, you know that some certain mutations have some uh, spontaneous, uh, what's called a spontaneous recovery, a spontaneous improvement uh, of different sorts depending of, on, the, on the mutation. Uh, then another important factor is the age of onset. So children usually have a better uh, prognosis than, than adults. And then another characteristic is the size of the optic nerve head. It's said that you know the bigger the size, the better the prognosis. And this is going to be something that we will have to take into account when we plan, when we design studies, um, because we want to rule out that the effect we see is due to a spontaneous. So we want to ascribe that effect to the to the molecule. Now, with Idevan on there, there were back in 2011 two fundamental publications. One at the top is the uh, a letter that uh, Valerio Carelli in Bologna, in Italy. Um, submitted to the Brain Journal, just presenting their experience over a number of years, four or five years, with a number of patients, more than 100 patients, with uh, I with Idevenon in different ways and forms and sorts. And the other one at the bottom is the results of the first ever clinical trial with Idevenon. It was a randomized, double-blind, placebo control. So everything that you would dream in terms of design, it was a perfect design. So in that year, in 2011, let's say the, the, um, the scenery of LHON started changing. Now, the, starting from the RODOS, the RODOS, and I, you said, you, I said that it was a failed study, and it's true because when you have the primary endpoint and that primary endpoint is not achieved, not met, we call the study failed now, but that's because it didn't meet the primary endpoint. Now, when we look at the data that was generated with that study in just six months of therapy, it's impressive. And that actually was the seed for the future studies that were developed with Idevenon, with gene therapy, et cetera, et cetera. So the learnings there were fantastic. And what we are showing on, on this, or Dr. Karani is showing on this slide, is that despite the primary endpoint being non-significant, statistically significant, we had a number of secondary endpoints 
that actually pointed us on the right direction. For example, one of them would be the potential to evaluate going from off chart, so not being able to read, to on chart at a certain degree. So that we could see that it was it was achievable in some way. The other one is um, the moment that you could you could see you could start the therapy. You see there that some patients had one eye with better vision than other in a certain degree. That indicated that probably if you start the treatment early enough, you might get a benefit. All right. And then another another secondary endpoint which was important is the. Um, yeah, the, the 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 patients that had the uh, the possibility of in, improving the the visual acuity, not just a few letters, but a significant number of letters. You all know that during the day, your visual acuity can be better or worse depending on how tired you are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, that variation needs to be considered, and that's why that uh, response analysis was was de was designed. So. With that learning, we have to take home message. One is that the primary endpoint was failed, but there are a lot of indicators that if we look at the right point, the right direction, we could see potential efficacy. And that uh, helps us understand the, the publication by Carelli helps us understand another thing. Carelli presents his results over a number of years. The Rhodes study was just six months. So what this slide is indicating, or Carelli's experience is indicating, is that if you had treated probably the, the, the patient for a longer time, you would have probably seen differences which would be significant. So that's one thing that obviously was that learning was used in the design of, of further studies. Now, with that in mind, the, uh, the developers of, of IDEVENON in LHON then I started looking at other bits of information like the expanded access. The expanded access was a way of getting more experience. In rare diseases, every single piece of information, being positive or negative, is fundamental. We don't have the luxury of ignoring things. So here, uh, using real world data, the company collected information and that brought new learnings. Like for example, it might take up to two years or even three years to start seeing effects. So don't give up if in six months you don't see results. That's one of the learnings that we that we had here. And the other thing is the, the, the response of the therapy might not be the same when you start the treatment during the first year since onset, or whether you start the treatment after one year since onset, what we call the chronic phase. So one has to take that into account when designing studies, okay? So that took us to the third study. So once the drug had been approved by the European authorities, uh, there was a need to design something that would kind of confirm what we knew, and that's LEROS, which is the one I'm gonna be talking uh, to you and the one that has been recently published. So everything I'm presenting is in the public domain. So the LEROS study was aimed to Confirm that long-term treatment is a good option. Confirm that treating early, uh, early onset patients, so patients that, that, that start treatment in the first month after the onset is as good as treating uh, in, the, in the chronic phase one year after the onset. And the other thing is that, uh, as you, if you see, the only study that was controlled in a proper manner was Rhodes, which was just six months and it, it failed. So now we needed to find a way of having a control group. The way of having a control group at that stage when the drug is already available, et cetera, et cetera, is what was done, which was collect in a very thorough manner, retrospective data from untreated patients from several sites in the world in order to be able to get a better knowledge on the natural history. Not only that, but then, those patients were, the eyes of the patients were matched, I'm not going to go into that in detail, with the eyes of the patients treated in Leros. So that we have a natural history control group. This is one of the characteristics of Leros. So it's a control study. Not the perfect, because that would be placebo, but I don't think that at this stage we can use placebo anymore, of course. So Another characteristic of the LEROS, uh, apart from the duration and what I've said, is the way that efficacy is measured. I've told you that um, 
you know, one aims for recovery, which is obviously one objective for, for treating with any drug, with any intervention. But then another thing you have to look at is prevention of further deterioration. So if you are at a, at a, at a certain level of visual acuity deterioration, it would be good if the drug would be able to stop the progression, knowing that the natural history is towards a deep and severe visual function deficit. So taking that into account, there were several endpoints that were uh, considered. One is the what we call the clinically relevant recovery, CRR, which aims at identifying a recovery in visual acuity, which is meaningful from a clinical point of view. Not just two letters, not just one letter, no, 10 letters. Okay, so that's one of the, the, the criteria. That can happen while you have, we are able to read, so you are on chart, but it's also measured when you are off chart. So if you are off chart and you manage to go on chart and be able to read one line of the, um, the ATDRS chart, then that would be considered that you achieve that objective, clinically relevant recovery. Together with that, another way to, to look at the efficacy would be prevention of further deterioration. So if you happen to start treatment when you are still non-legally blind, a way of measuring the, the efficacy of the, of the treatment would be that you stay in that category. You don't progress into legally blind after the, the, the year treatment. And that's what we call clinically relevant stabilization, CRS. Now, so then we have both of them. So if you achieve any of those endpoints, any of those objectives, we could consider that you've benefited from the treatment. So if you either have clinically relevant stabilization and or clinically relevant recovery, we would say that you've had a clinically relevant benefit. So you've benefited in a relevant way from the treatment. So now in Leros, what, they, uh, what the, the primary endpoint this time was not the number of letters that you change, etc. No, no, it's you either have what we consider a clinically relevant benefit, so you hit the, the response that we want, or you don't. If you hit it, then you have a clinically relevant benefit. And that's how things were measured. The treated eyes against the untreated eyes. So that's important to remember, which is something that reinforces all the learnings that we have. Now, going into the results, I've said to you that there are two, let's say, groups where you can look at the efficacy. One is the, what we call subacute dynamic. So the day you start having your symptoms all over the next 12 months, it's what is canonically considered subacute dynamic. So it's early treatment in the early phases of the disease in simple terms. So one way, of looking at Leros is analyzing what happens to those patients in the early stages when you treat them over a period of one year, two years, etc. So what we show here is the uh, the primary endpoint, which was defined as clinically relevant benefit after twelve months uh, of of therapy, so one year of therapy in this group of patients that had a recent onset, recent meaning less than one year, okay? So, and here I'm, I'm, showing you the, I'm showing you the results. So you can see, maybe I can describe it to you, that treated eyes had a clinically relevant benefit, which was relevant and significantly better than the natural history, which is the untreated eyes. Um, I can't read the figures here, but statistically significant. And this is what the study was looking for. So technically, this is a, a positive study, right? So we have a positive study here. Not only at 12 months, but at 24 months. So if you continue the treatment, someone might say, well, that's just that at 12 months you improve, but at 24, you, you don't improve anymore or you fail. No, what you saw at 12 months is maintained at 24 months of therapy which is good news, okay? Further along, then we need to look at the other group of patients, the ones that have been with the disease for more than a year when they start treatment. So do these patients still benefit? And one thing that I want to actually highlight here is when we talk this chronic is 
more than one year, but less than five. That, that was the criteria. So we didn't study more than five years in Johnson. The good news about this is, yes, when you start treatment even after a year, compared to the non-treatment, you see that the difference is not only relevant, but statistically significant, both at 12 months of treatment and at 24 months of treatment. So with this, we can say that the drug, medic the medicine shows efficacy in both populations, recent onset, late onset, as well as short treatment, long treatment. So that is something, one of the learnings and one of the important things about um, the Lera's study. Now, this links with the consensus. You've all heard probably about the consensus that was uh, reached by the people that actually participated in the meetings that, that, that you were presenting early on. Uh, those are the experts. And they got together at some point in, in 1920, sorry, in 2016, and they decided that, you know, in patients in the, the first year since onset, they should be treated with 900 milligrams, et cetera, et cetera, as soon as possible, all right? And they should be treated for a year. And why for a year? Because one of the learnings that we had from the expanded access and from Carelli's data is that it might take actually many months before you even notice some kind of improvement. So interrupting the, the, the treatment too soon might lead to not enough uh, evidence or not enough recovery. So they recommended now with Leros, with the data from Leros, not only confirm that you need a long, a long time, but we also confirm now that you might even need two years before you consider whether there is efficacy or not. That's another important learning here. Now uh, we've talked about efficacy. Now we talk about safety. Safety that, that uh, of, of Idebenon is, is known. It's there's nothing, uh, let's say, serious or nothing to be worried about. Uh, obviously, except that you have to watch for potential problems. But in terms of safety, this is a, a drug that has a what we call a favorable risk benefit. So the benefit out outweighs the risk enormously. So that's perfect. However, you know, things evolve. And uh, previously we've mentioned the, the, uh, the NQ1 and the, the, new, the, the new developments in terms of, of learnings about the, uh, the way that, you know, the, the, the disease starts and the way that uh, the, the drug, the medicine, I keep on saying drug, I don't know why, uh, the medicine works, okay? And one of the things that uh, sort of recently was published is that in certain patients that have a mutation in another completely unrelated protein uh, gene, you might have uh, a lack of efficacy of idebenon. So idebenon needs this NQ01. And what the authors are saying is that could explain why some patients in Leros with the mutation 3460, actually some of them, not all, but some of them didn't do well and they deteriorate. So that's like a new piece of information that we still, let's say, need to digest because we need to put that in the proper context. So uh, as I said, in the 3460 mutation in Leros, it was observed this strange behavior which is totally counterintuitive because in the natural history, we know that the, the prognosis of the 3460 is, is very, very small, uh, spontaneous improvement. So uh, this is, you know, what's the space? There's going to be new publications. We are actually reviewing the data uh, in order to see what is what is this information telling us, okay? Now, in the meantime, as pretty logical, uh, obviously the experts debate on, on you know, what's, what's our action here. And some experts, just for you to know, uh, they are being very cautious when it comes to this, and they say, well, in the 3460, careful, you know, Devenon, you know, think it well, and you guys talk to, to your physician if you have the 3460, whether you should be, and then the physician will discuss this with you, uh, the pros and cons, and then the decision will be made. But I'm showing you this slide because some uh, well-known experts prefer to be cautious, and they say there might be, there might, might be, um, problem might be harmful for this 3460. Anyway, we are looking into that. The experts are obviously looking into that, why some patients might deteriorate while others improve. 
obviously the conclusion is we don't know enough about the disease yet. So anything, and uh, I, I insist what, what Melinda has said, put the data in the registry, put the data in databases. Every single drop counts. Every single piece of information counts. So this will help us to clarify this situation. And that's all on my side. Thank you very much for your attention. One of the other uh, update elements that Dr. Karanja intended to go over with us today is the arena of gene therapy. Um, many of us know that there have been several initiatives in the realm of gene therapy. Um, Dr. John Guy at Bascom Palmer in Florida um, was very instrumental in doing gene therapy work in the LHON community. Um, about 30 patients were treated in that study. Also, there's a company called Gensite, a French company, and they did uh, a couple of studies that uh, people uh, in our community have participated in. One's called Rescue, and Rescue recruited individuals with the 11778 mutation who were um, affected for zero, zero to six months and reverse recruited individuals affected from six to 12 months. And they um, also um, did another study uh, which um, included, so that was treating in um, one eye and um, the other eye was untreated and the intent was for the untreated eye to be the placebo control against the treated eye. Um, what was found was that while the treatment was generally safe, um, they also found that uh, they unexpectedly, both eyes, um, the amount of improvement that was found was identical in both the treated and untreated eyes. Um, that again, that was unexpected. Uh, the third study, Reflect, uh, was recruiting individuals um, affected zero to 12 months. Um, and that study was also um, a gen site study. Um, and uh, Unlike the study that we just were hearing about, where going into it, there was a match um, of treated eyes to natural history eyes. In the gen site situation, they had expected to use the untreated eye as their um, natural history control. But when the outcome in both eyes was identical, that meant that the um, untreated eye wasn't a good placebo control. So retrospectively, um, there's been comparison done um, against a natural history study, and they're finding differences um, between the treatment uh, and the natural history looked at retrospectively. There have also been efforts trying to compare um, published reports of natural history, idebinone, and uh, the gene therapy product. One thing that is found um, is that no matter when treatment occurs, patients still seem to get worse. Uh, folks often enter a treatment situation, whether it's with idebinone, as we were just hearing, or in the gene therapy situation, and everybody is hoping it will stop uh, the decline, and that just doesn't seem to happen. That decline in the acute stage is something that seems to happen. And then in some situations, uh, there can be some improvement. In addition to the um, gene therapy trials that have been undertaken at um, Bascom Palmer uh, and by the French company Gensite, there's also a Chinese company called Neuroff, and they've been doing some work uh, in both the 11778 mutation and the 3460 mutation. Um, the 11778 study is still underway. Um, and Chris, did you want to talk a little bit about the 3460 situation and where we go from here? Yeah, I'd be happy to. <clears throat> Let's see, does this work? Can you hear me? So the, uh, the nature of some of these trials, just putting this in context, is, um, is a journey. And uh, 
I, I'm hearkening back to the dialogue that Phil Yeski led yesterday uh, for those who were in the room next door about being clinical trial ready at all times. And um, one of the key points that I took away from feedback from Phil, but also from numerous other patient advocacy group leaders was that failure is the norm. So when we start talking about what Xavier just walked us through, failure to meet an endpoint does not mean that we didn't learn a lot or that there wasn't even to some degree clinically relevant uh, benefits of some type. Um, one of the things that you'll see if you follow clinicaltrials.gov, uh, which is the NIH portal for all trials uh, that would take place, is that this is still recruiting. Uh, the latest information that we have, let me go to the next slide. No. Yes. Uh, the latest information that we have as of the last few days is that um, that NeurIP will be uh, terminating this trial. Uh, they have not communicated that fully yet, so we're going to let them own that message. But what I want to just encourage us to consider is that if you have participated or if you have looked at and considered participating in this trial, it's a really important conversation to have with our healthcare professionals about uh, the current standing of that and what is appropriate in terms of the follow-on uh, care and the follow-on uh, appointments uh, that will be scheduled uh, with those uh, healthcare professionals. And I also just want us to consider that if indeed this is stopped for the right reasons, that's the appropriate thing for any company, any sponsor of a trial to do. If it's not measuring up to enough of a clinically relevant benefit, then the right thing to do is to pause or is to stop a trial in order to better inform how we might be even more effective at trials going forward and make sure that your journey is preserved in that context. So I hope if you have additional questions, we will have some new information coming in the days ahead. We've been actively encouraging the company and the CRO to communicate before 8 a.m. on Friday today, uh, but we haven't gotten any more information yet. And I just would expect us to uh, con continue to um, let them own that message when it's appropriate too, but we wanted to be transparent about what we've learned. Putting it in this broader context that we referenced in the community updates, uh, this is a major priority for LHON as a community and the LHON collective team that got together back in February, which we referenced as the Lisbon Portugal um, retreat, really helped to define some of the core priorities uh, that these researchers, these leading minds suggest we need to dive into next to think about even greater efficacy and even greater clinically relevant benefits to our community. And while we talked about a few, well, we talked about one specific example that Melinda referenced of the tissue donation program and how that can inform some of the basic research, basic science levels. And Linda, I loved your comment uh, referencing the science team earlier. Uh, Linda referenced uh, how important it is to understand the cellular mechanics of all this. And Linda, you're not alone. We're all learning about this as we go. Um, but what, what I think is really important from, from the slide that I'm, I've got up right now is just to know that these leading minds are helping us to prioritize on the left-hand side, basic research, basic science, core questions that really need to be addressed to more effectively understand what the right-hand side would, inf um, would benefit from, which are these translational therapies and these therapeutics. And so with Xavier's education about how do we think about trials, how do we think about the trials that we've already seen related to small molecules, uh, such as idebanon, how do we make sure that we're making the most of the benefit that they already present and that many in our community have benefited from and remain mindful of where gene therapy, gene editing, and even certain stem cell approaches may be relevant in the long long game. We are playing a long game here and there'll be short and medium term uh, milestones along the way. But I hope you're taking away from the entirety of this morning that there are a whole bunch of ways in which you, your voice, your experience can inform this broader roadmap, this broader strategy, and even how regulators, FDA here in the US, EMA over in Europe, even Pedro was teaching me about regulators with the SUS uh, system down in Brazil, how your voice can actually inform patient reported outcome measures and other uh, significantly uh, important um, indicators of these clinically relevant benefits. So I hope that brings it together and let's all pass it back to you. So I want to thank uh, Chris and Melinda uh, and Lissa for uh, their help moderating this this panel and, and helping in the planning of it. 
and also a, a great thanks to Dr. Loria, who stepped in as our, our physician speaker today. Um, unfortunately, we're you know for time management purposes, we're not going to be able to take questions. But as you know, we're all available, including Dr. Loria. Uh, and and I, he would probably tell me uh, I've known him now for a few months, and, and that we could call him Xavier. That's true. <laughs> and uh, but find him. Uh, yeah, he's he's very available to our community. Uh, he's a, a, a gracious man and uh, a, a big round of applause to him for stepping up. Thank you.